This pandemic is affecting just about all aspects of our lives in just about every country of the world. Many people are afraid of getting infected with the virus. Others have mild symptoms and are scared that those symptoms are going to progress. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm a pulmonologist treating COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit. By the time many patients reach me, they are very sick. And those who do not die, their improvement is very slow. I wish there was something that I could do to prevent the people from coming in to be so seriously ill in the first place. With this in mind, I'd like to share how the simple habit of taking hot and cold showers may help to enhance your immunity in the fight against COVID-19. But first, let's talk about fever. Many people think of fever as a bad thing. Although extremely high fevers can be dangerous, fever can be very useful for fighting infection. In 1927, Julius Wagner Joreg, an Austrian psychiatrist, won the Nobel Prize in medicine for using fever to treat syphilis and the dementia that it caused. This was before the discovery of penicillin. So he actually injected his patients with malaria and the fevers from the malaria cured the infection of the neurosyphilis. He then treated the malaria with quinine sulfate and the patient was free of both diseases. Thankfully, getting malaria isn't the only way to affect body temperature in order to fight infection. This can also be done through water. A growing body of research shows that hydrothermal treatments are useful for fighting viruses and other pathogens. These treatments have been shown to be beneficial for a wide variety of illnesses and have even been used during past pandemics. In 1918, Seventh-day Adventist sanitariums used hot and cold water treatments to treat the flu pandemic very effectively. Although heat is useful, contrasting hot and cold treatments may even be better and more beneficial for your immunity. Some research indicates that these type of treatments can actually benefit the specific part of the immune system that COVID-19 attacks in the early phases. This means that hot and cold showers may help prevent people with the early stages of COVID-19 from progressing as far as they might otherwise. These treatments may also be useful as a preventative measure for people who are not yet infected Although further research is needed, this simple practice is low risk, realizing that it may increase the risk of arrhythmias, but it's worth a try. Here's how it works. Turn the shower water to as hot as you can tolerate without burning yourself. It shouldn't exceed 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Focus the water primarily on your upper back, your throat, and your chest. After three minutes of hot, switch the water to as cold as you can tolerate for 30 seconds to a minute, then switch back to hot. Repeat this cycle for at least three times. Three minutes hot, 30 seconds to a minute cold. Repeat it three times. When you're done with your shower, cover up warmly and rest. Doing this at least once a day and possibly even multiple times a day may help to enhance your immune system as it fights all kinds of different bugs. God is always on the front line, working to keep us well. He created water as a useful tool for our health. It says in Psalms 91, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. I can attest that this truly works. For the last few years, maybe three, four years, I have been doing this very thing and I can tell you that it works. This has been my experience. My name is Samuel Indreu, and I serve as a pastor at a number of churches in the Chicagoland area. I am glad that you are with us tonight. I want to welcome you to our second night of our Fearful or Fearless series, Navigating Life's Crisis. Tonight, our topic will be fear of illness, and we will build upon the first night, Dr. Eddie Ramirez. Those of you who joined us last night and who are here tonight, you know that we were blessed uh, in the presentation last night. As we move on, uh, I want to make just a few quick announcements. First of all, you have friends, you have neighbors, you have family members that will benefit from the information that we will receive tonight from Dr. Mark Sandoval. I can tell you that the information that we received tonight, most family practice, most other doctors will not give you because they don't know any better. So tonight, it is very important that you call them, 
share the invitation with them, send them a text, uh, invite them via Facebook or any other means, and uh, they will be blessed and they will be glad that you have called them. So please share. Also, remember that these videos will remain on Facebook. They will remain on YouTube. So you can share the video itself afterwards as well. Another way that you can help us is by holding a watch party on Facebook if you know how to do that. And finally, we love it when you send us your comments. We love it when you send us your questions. And uh, most of you should be able to do this on Facebook. You can just make a comment on YouTube as well. If you, if you are uh, signed in, you can make comments as well. And I want to do a test. This is just a test to see if you know how to do it. Can you please tell us where are you watching from? So I would like to, um, yeah, just a simple test. Tell us where are you watching from? Our guest tonight is Dr. Mark Sandoval. Uh, he is a board certified emergency medicine and lifestyle medicine physician. Currently, he serves as the medical director of the Uchi Pines Institute, a lifestyle center. He's also director of the Gulf State Conference Health Ministries Department. He also has founded his, uh, a, a ministry that is called New Paradigm Ministry. In addition to this, Dr. Sandoval has a passion for God and seeks to serve him in everything that he does. He particularly enjoys sharing about the gospel and its impact, impact upon healing, uh, spiritual healing, emotional, and physical. He also enjoys home life with his wife and seven children. Perfect number, number seven. Before we have him on, I would like us to join and to pray. Let's pray together. Loving Father in heaven, what a privilege it is that tonight we can join again, we can listen and learn more about our own bodies, more about illness, more about how we can prevent illness and the reasons why we do not need to fear illness. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will guide Dr. Sandoval as he presents. We pray that you guide our discussion. I pray, Lord, that you would be with the listeners, with those who are watching, and um, maybe cause them to have certain questions, practical questions that would benefit them and benefit other people too. Lord, we know that without you, we cannot do anything. But with you, all things are possible. So, Father, we love you, and we invite your presence here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a privilege to be able to share with you today uh, in regards to this topic of the fear of illness. And we are going to um, just pull this up. And um, let's see. Sorry, that's not the, the one. I'm just going to get this for you just in a second. But how many of you have been afraid of the, uh, you know, getting sick, getting sick, having illness? Um, we have had a, a, a bunch of uh, diseases, illnesses that have happened lately. And uh, we have found ourselves in some very difficult circumstances lately. And there is a lot of fear. And... <clears throat> And um, let's see, there we go. We should have fine connection here. Um, we should be, uh, sorry, having network connections, there we go. Sorry. Technical issues, just getting that set up again. There we go. 
All right, so looking at the fear of illness, why do we have illness? We need to, we need to have uh, an understanding of cause and effect. You see the situation here with the car coming over the edge and an ambulance down in the valley. Is that going to be helpful in this situation or would it be uh, helpful for us to put guardrails and lines on the road and to slow down the speed limit? Now, it would definitely be better for us to deal with issues up here on the top of the mountain than it would be just saving people down at the bottom of the mountain. Now, there is a law of cause and effect, and that law of cause and effect shows that every effect must have a cause, that every cause must produce an effect, that if the effect is present, well, the cause is also present as well, and if the cause is removed, then the effect must go away. And that is because no effect can produce itself because it's dependent upon power, it's dependent upon materials outside of itself in order to function, in order to exist. And because of that, you're never gonna find an effect that's without a cause, and there is really no such thing as chance, there's nothing that's truly random, everything has a cause. Everything has a cause. In fact, the, the Bible shows us the curse causeless shall not come in uh, Proverbs 26 and verse 2. Now, when it comes to cause and effect, we must identify cause, the cause of illness or disease, and remove it and try to not get caught up in just treating the effects. And I, I tell you, a lot of us get caught up in just treating the effects, and so then we end up having the, the condition and the disease or the illness for, for a long time and never really getting over it. Now, to understand what's happening, we have the analogy of a road here, and on the road is health. And there's proper function, and it's comfortable while you're on the road. And there's certain things that you need in order to maintain health. You've got to have oxygen. You've got to have water. You've got to have food. You've got to have warmth, right? These are various different things you need. It's not the complete list, but just an example. And outside, if you get off the road, then you get to dysfunction. And it becomes uncomfortable. Dysfunctional and uncomfortable. And what is it that defines whether you're on the road or whether you're off the road? Well, that is law. Laws define whether you're inside where it's healthy, comfortable, and functioning properly, or whether you're outside and it's dysfunctional or uncomfortable. And, and for everything, for example, there's a law that governs the function of your blood sodium levels. And so your blood sodium levels should be between 125 and 135 milliequivalents per deciliter. And your blood potassium levels should be between about 3.5 to 5.5 uh, milligrams per deciliter and so on. Your pH is around uh, 7 point, uh, you know, 7 point four or five, somewhere in that range. Uh, 7.35 to 7.45. And so there are upper limits of normal, there's lower limits of normal, and um, there's laws that define whether you're in one or whether you're in the other. Now, if you get outside of the laws and you go outside of the law, then let's say your body temperature. If your temperature starts going up, well, you're going to start feeling hot. It's going to be uncomfortable. You have symptoms. And as your temperature continues going up, you'll end up with disease like heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And if it continues going up, well, you're eventually going to die. You'll go, from you'll go from proper function to progressive dysfunction until you have no function at all. And you'll go from comfortable to uncomfortable to very uncomfortable uh, and so on as you get away from the law. And so health is proper function, which is the effect of staying within the law. And disease is dysfunction, which is the effect of going outside of the law. Right? So proper function inside the law, dysfunction outside the law. And symptoms and disease, they're like the rumble strips on the side of the road. They have a good function. The function is there to let you know something is wrong. Right? It's to let you know that something is wrong. And um, so <clears throat> we have functional laws that govern how we work and how we operate. And all the laws that govern our function 
were in place during the first week of creation. Every law that governs our function was in place during that first week of creation. And so when a loving creator came to this earth and made the earth and day by day created various different uh, components of that light and atmosphere, so they had air and land and plants and so on, which comes with food, right? Fruits and vegetables and other things of that nature. And then came with different animals and water and seas and other things of that nature. And then there was man, which was the crowning work of creation. And God lovingly formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And by that time, he had made everything that was necessary for man to live and function. And so there are health principles that we can see right there in the creation story. For example, sunshine, Genesis 1 and verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, that was light. We know that sunshine didn't come until day 4. And, um, but sunshine, that light, is very important. We get vitamin D from that sunshine. We get... Uh, the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin and the retina that helps us with our uh, our mood. And so uh, we have the conversion of uh, um, substances that we get from the plants that we eat, that uh, the chlorophyll from it, that when the light strikes the chlorophyll in our body, when we have eaten the greens, then it converts it into a highly active form that then provides power for the system and antioxidants. So there's all sorts of benefits to being out in the sunshine. It's something that you need in order to live. And if you stay away from it, well, things are not gonna go well. It'll, you'll be okay for a while, but it'll start getting worse and worse over time. Vitamin D deficiency is associated with heart disease, it's associated with dementia, it's associated with uh, insulin resistance and diabetes with uh, obesity. It's a, it's associated with all cancer, all sorts of things when we are vitamin D deficient. Another principle that was given to us, uh, to man, a law of how we function is fresh air. Genesis 1 and verses 6 through 8, then God said, let there be a firmament, and he called the firmament heaven, atmosphere, air, fresh air for us to breathe. And that's exactly what God wanted for us was that fresh air to breathe. And to breathe it and be in a fresh environment is great for us. But when we ruin that environment by smoking or by being in secondhand smoke or air pollution areas um, and uh, polluting the air by having the windows closed and the doors closed and just recirculating the air with the air conditioning and other things of that nature, we want to open up the windows, bring plants into the home, breathe the fresh air, get out into fresh environments. That is all good for you. Pure water. And Genesis 1 and verse 7, uh, thus God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And so, so God provided water for us to drink. That's the ideal beverage for humanity. Now, of course, we've come up with all sorts of other things. Back in the Garden of Eden, there wasn't Dr. Pepper and, and other sodas and other things of that nature. Water is the best. That's the best that we can have. And, um, and uh, she... Uh, um, you know, so we have we have that for us. And not only water to drink and stay hydrated, which we should stay well hydrated so that preferably your urine is very pale colored uh, throughout the day, but also we have water for bathing and keeping us clean on the outside as well. And that's really important. And if others are around you when you haven't been bathing, well, they'll tell you that it's important as well. And uh, we also have the principle of proper nutrition. And, and Genesis 129, God said, I have given you the herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree that the fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Yeah. And, um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, a benefit and health that you can have in eating the way God created us to eat, and the way God created us at the beginning was a plant-based diet. Adam and Eve weren't chasing down animals and killing them and eating them in the Garden of Eden. No, they were caring for them and taking care of them. And that was the best uh, diet that humanity had, was living in a garden and eating the fruit and the seeds and the nuts and the whole grains that were growing. And as we return to that, then that is going to, uh, that is going to be something that will help out significantly in preventing disease and reversing that when you have it.
rest. Genesis 2 and verse 2, and on the seventh day he ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. And rest, of course, includes the, the hours of sleep that one gets at night, but it also includes restoration, includes uh, recreation, it includes uh, a weekly rest, of breaking that weekly cycle. Uh, and so some people call that a Sabbath rest, taking time apart and uh, not participating in all the same work activities and so on, and taking time out of nature and with God and re re restoration. All of these are quite beneficial for one's health, and all of these are laws of our function that were in place during creation. Also, being out in nature and in the environment. And in Genesis 2 and verse 8, the Lord God planted the, a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man whom he had formed in that garden. And in fact, nature is the best environment for man to be in. There's all sorts of research that shows that being out in nature helps to, it, it helps to reverse uh, heart failure. It helps to improve, improve immune function. Uh, it helps to improve mood. There are all sorts of benefits associated with simply being in nature, around the trees and the grass and the animals and the birds singing and all of that kind of stuff. It's so much better than being in a city environment. You know, and if you are in the city, well, hey, go to the park every once in a while. Uh, in fact, there's some research that so shows that if you get into a natural environment uh, and spend a day in a natural environment at least once a week, that it has a benefit all the way through the rest of the week. So if you take that Sabbath day, that Sabbath time away from work and everything else like that, go find a good nature area. It can have benefits all through the rest of the week while you're, you're beyond that. It's beautiful. Also, occupation and exercise. God created man to do things, to accomplish things. Uh, then the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That was part of what God intended for us. So yes, we are to exercise, but it's not just an exercise to see how many, you know, how big my muscles can get and how stretchy I can be and other things of that nature. It's really an exercise of doing things that are beneficial that are uh, that help others that accomplish something so like gardening and taking care of the yard and helping the neighbors and doing other things of that nature that's the kind of occupation and exercise that we really need and then there is restraint or self-control you see in genesis 2 16 and 17 god he put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in there and he said don't eat of that you can eat of everything else so there was some restraint there was self-control and that's what we need to exercise as well uh, to, to just say, okay, wait, no, no, don't need to eat that much. No, you know, that probably tastes good, but I know it's not the best for me, and so let's lay off of that. Temperance or self-control really has to do with uh, avoiding that which is harmful to you and using wisely that which is good. And so all of these are principles that we have in the creation week. And also, oh, so beneficial. Genesis 2, 21 and 22, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made to the woman and he brought her to the man. So Adam had to trust God to make his life partner for him. So there was trust in God that was there and then there was companionship that came. And these are really important parts uh, of, uh, of this, this whole plan is that companionship and that trust in God that he has designed for us. And so God the, God, the God of creation is the same God today. He's the same God today. And the same principles that guaranteed, guaranteed health in the Garden of Eden are the same principles that maintain health now. And he loves us and he wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be happy. And he's given us what we need to maintain health. But what happens if we lose that health? Hmm. Well, what is disease and what can we do about it? Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. So you see, when law is broken and we go outside of the laws that govern the function of our body and how it's supposed to operate, then disease is the result of that. When we get off the road, then disease becomes one of the things we run into. And so in the case of sickness, well, we should find out what the cause is and then change things. Right? That's what we should do. In Exodus 15, 26, we're told, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I brought on the Egyptians, from the Lord who heals you. Right? So, so God, has, God has said, you know what? I love you, and I want you to be healthy. And there's a way that you can be healthy. And that is 
follow the things that I have created for you. Live in the way that I have designed for you because it's the best way. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. I don't know, you've probably been in situations like I have where you've been involved in stuff and you knew you shouldn't be there and there's all the guilt and there's the there's self-condemnation and there's other stuff like that. You just don't feel good. But there's other times when, when you're doing what you know that you should and you're helping others and you're doing things and there's just this lightness, there's this joy in your heart. God wants you to have that right? He really does. Proverbs 4, 20 to 23, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. So we see health has a lot to do with uh, enjoying a relationship with God. Then it shall come to pass because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them that the Lord your God will love you and bless you and multiply you and he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land and you shall be blessed above all the peoples and shall, there shall not be a male or female barren among you and the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. God wants us to be free of those things but there's some cooperation that needs to come along with it. So what do we use if we are diseased, if we do have disease, if we've got other things? We saw a video with uh, Dr. Roger Schwelt, and he was talking about doing contrast showers, some hot and cold, other things like that. Well, yeah, that's good. Let's read here. It says, natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about supernatural results. You see, it's not just the thing we use, but it's the God behind it that brings about the results. We ask for a miracle. And the Lord directs the mind to some simple remedy, like taking a contrast shower. We ask to be kept from the pestilence. We are then to cooperate with God, observing the laws of health and life. Now, if you want God to keep you healthy, but you do everything to cause disease, well, that's not going to work very well. you got to cooperate with him. You know, it's like a parent who wants the child to, to be happy. Well, if you do all of the grumpy things, you're not going to be happy. If you keep thinking on the bad stuff, if you keep doing the bad things, you're not going to be happy. And if the parents want you to be happy, there's some cooperation that has to happen in good things so that you can be happy. Well, God wants that for you. God gives us no encouragement that he will do for us what we can do for ourselves. Natural laws are to be obeyed. We are not to fail of doing our part. Yeah, we've got a part to do, sure. There are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there's only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. So it's simple stuff. Simple stuff is profound. It's profound. It really is. Now let's look at some examples in the Bible of simple things that have profound results. Remember, used in accordance with God's will brings about supernatural results. So it's not the thing itself per se, although God has put healing properties in the things that he has made, but it's it's the God behind it when we use it in faith. So here's Hezekiah. Hezekiah was sick. He had he was sick to death with boils. He had a big absence. And prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order that thou shalt die and, you'll look, and not live. Then, he, then Hezekiah, Hezekiah, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, Oh, Lord, remember now how I walk before you in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which was good in thy sight. And, and Hezekiah wept sore and it came to pass at, at four, before Isaiah had gone even out of the middle of the court, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Go back, tell Hezekiah that I've listened to him. I've heard his prayer. And I've seen his tears and I will heal him. And the third day he will go up out of the house to the house of the Lord, and I'll give him 15 extra years. And what did he do? He, he said, take a lump of figs. And they take, took it, and they laid it on the boil, and he recovered. They used figs, a lump of figs. You know, we've used that in our lifestyle center to help individuals with various things. It helps. Naaman. Oh, Naaman had leprosy. Oh, how hard is it to cure leprosy? So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will come again to you and you shall be clean. And he was angry. Why was he angry? Because he thought he was going to do this hocus pocus and he was going to lay his hands on him and he was going to do this and say this and do this other kind of thing and whatever. And he was mad and he thought, oh, 
you know, surely, I mean, in where I live, there's the Abana and the Far Far, these rivers in Damascus. They're clean. They're beautiful. What about this? Jordan is muddy. I don't want to go there. So he turned away and he was angry. Why? Because his expectations weren't met. And his servants came to him and they talked to him and they said, um, if he had asked you to do some great thing like climb Mount Everest, wouldn't you have done it? And how much easier it is it then to just go wash and be clean? So they talked some sense into him and he went back and he went down to the Jordan and he dipped down once and he wasn't clean and twice and he wasn't clean and three times and four times and five times and six times. He's still no improvement. And the seventh time he came up and no more leprosy. He was clean. And his flesh came to him and it was the flesh of a little child. He was clean. What was it? It was water. But really, was it the water doing it? No, it was the God behind it that was healing him. Job. Job, uh, the, the devil gave him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And what did he do? He did natural remedies. He scraped himself with a pot shirt. You, one of the treatments for abscesses is incision and drainage. You cut it open and you let it drain out. That's what he was doing. And he sat in ashes. What's ashes? Charcoal. That's right. Charcoal is a natural remedy. And those natural remedies of charcoal can help with infections, with abscesses and other things of that nature. So Job was doing natural remedies even way back then. And the blind man in John 9, 6 through 7, Jesus healed him. He, he spat on the ground. Oh, heaven forbid somebody does that nowadays. Anyway, so he spat on the ground, made clay with the spittle, and put it on the, on the eyelids of the, of the guy born blind. And he said, go to the pool of Siloam, which is sent, means sent. So he sent him to the pool. And he said, go wash. And when he did, he could see, right? So, so even Jesus used natural remedies, but was it the natural remedy that healed him? No, it was the God behind that. So Dave came to us and uh, he was obese and he was dealing with diabetes and he had chest pain and he was feeling miserable and he had been healthy before and he had you know, lived a healthy diet, but he was really busy. He was a busy executive and he just, as he, as he told me, he just let himself go. And here he was, and he came to our center, and uh, he spent five days with us. And uh, he did have a, a history, a past of, of a healthy lifestyle, and so I reminded him much of, of uh, what he had not been practicing and encouraged him to do so and to start changing uh, how he was going about doing things. And he did, and he started applying these health principles that we find from the Garden of Eden that we were just looking at, of drinking water rather than all this other stuff and eating plant foods rather than all this processed stuff and these animal products and, and, and getting exercise on a regular basis. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a miracle thing it's go walking go walking every day a few times a day and he did and he started losing weight and here's a picture of him after about 35 to 40 pounds that he lost he lost 56 pounds and he started walking he reversed his diabetes he reversed his heart disease he wasn't having any more chest pain the fatigue that he was dealing with went away oh he was so excited he was so excited well the diabetes took about six months before it was you know, no medication. He was, he was, uh, his blood sugar levels, his fasting blood sugar levels were below 90, but he kept at it, right? He kept at it. Reggie, he came to us and he had high blood pressure and he had stage four chronic kidney disease. It was a, it was a light stage four and, uh, and he was obese. And, and so he started learning these principles, these simple principles of health and so on. And he started applying those in his life. He ended up losing between 50 to 100 pounds. And it took him about two months for the high blood pressure to really start getting under control. But it did. And it got under control to the point where he could get off of his blood pressure medication. And his chronic kidney disease started turning around so that he got back into the normal range for his kidney function. Oh, amazing, beautiful stuff, right? Bad transformations that happen. Ivan came to us, um, and uh, again, he was dealing with obesity. He had diabetes. That was his main complaint why he was coming. And he had neuropathy, so he had pins and needles sensation and numbness and everything. And he was he was having blurry vision, difficulty you know seeing, and he was dealing with high blood pressure. He wasn't able to think very well, and it was difficult for him to walk. Well, his sister had come to our center, uh, I don't know, probably 12 years before he came. 
And she had breast cancer, and after she went and she applied the principles and she continued living them, well, her breast cancer went away, and, and she saw how her brother was doing, and so she encouraged him to come and to, and to learn how to live healthy and to cooperate with God in these simple things. And he started applying those things. And at the beginning of his program, his blood sugars were 173 fasting. A month later, they were 101. Not perfect, but much better. His hemoglobin A1C was 12, and then it came down to 9.7. It should be 5.6 or below, but it's coming. It's coming. His blood pressure was 153 over 102, and then it came down to 90 over 70. His cholesterol is 192, which is not great. 160 came down to 164, which is good. It's not ideal yet. We want it below 150, but it's getting there. His triglycerides were 158, which is not good. They came down to 80, which is ideal. His, his good cholesterol came up from 36 to 47. That was a good improvement. And his bad cholesterol went from 121 down to one, I mean, 124 down to 101, which is a significant improvement. We wanted at least below 100 and if diabetes below 70. So it's heading in the right direction all the way there yet at one month. And he was having difficulty walking when he came. And one month later, he's starting to train for a 5K. Now, all of these results came after he came off of all of his diabetes, blood pressure, and cholesterol medication. So we took him off of all of those medication and he had all of these improvements. Why or how? By applying simple, natural means, simple, natural remedies. Ray came to us. Ray came to us. He was a door-to-door a -door literature salesman. He would sell literature from door to door. And uh, he was unable to work because he couldn't get up a flight of stairs without having this crushing chest pain and this aching in his legs and so on. And, uh, and he, he, was, he had eight stents, you know, blockages in the arteries of his heart and opened up. And several of them they had to re-stent because they were blocking again. And he had claudication, which he had, you know, you know uh, aching pain in his legs when he walked a certain distance would have to rest and then wait and then walk again. He had carotid bruise, so you could hear the swishing of the blood going past the blockages in his in his neck. That's that'll set you up for a stroke. He was what we call a vasculopath. He just had a horrible case of everything. And Ray then came to our center and started applying these simple things, natural remedies. We use water, we use herbs, we use diet, we use exercise, we use fresh air and sunshine and going out for walks and, and stress management and helping individuals learn better how to trust in God and all of that kind of stuff. And, and Ray applied these and he went home and he continued applying it with his wife. And here's Ray later. And he's happy. He's still enjoying, enjoying his grandchildren. He can walk. He doesn't have that crushing chest pain anymore. His, his cardiovascular disease was reversing. Why? Because the application of simple, natural remedies, right? Mary came to us. She was morbidly obese. She had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and heart failure. And she didn't know it, but she had diabetes too. And we, we found that out when we did blood work with her when she came to our center. She had poor quality of life. She could barely make it from her living room to the attached garage to get into her car. And she'd take her 10 minutes to catch her breath when she got into the car. Well, she came to our center and she had to walk quite further than that in order to, in order to get to the kitchen. Well, she kept walking a little bit more, a little bit more every day, every day. In four weeks, in four weeks, well, six weeks, she was strengthening her health habits. She followed the laws of health. And over six weeks' time, she lost 30 pounds. She, her blood sugars came normal. Her blood pressure was controlled. She was getting her life back under control. And she was able to walk over two miles a day. Jackie with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia by the end of the session, uh, she was doing better, losing some weight, decreased pain, but still having some struggles. Four to five months later, she was continuing her new lifestyle. She was sleeping through the night like a baby, no pain whatsoever. Her chronic fatigue was gone and she'd lost 60 pounds by that time. Lillian, she uh, developed lymphoma and was told she had one year to live. She came to Uchi Pines years ago. I met her when I went to a camp meeting uh, 22 years later. 22 years later, no lymphoma. Happy Lillian. 
Can the natural means work? Yeah. Do you have to be afraid of, of illness, of disease, and other things? No, you don't have to. There are ways of treating it, and there's ways of preventing it, and God has them all in his word, and he is the Savior today, and he wants to heal you now just like he was healing people back then, and he loves you, and he wants to set you free, but he's got to have your cooperation. Remember, when he healed people, he said, your faith has made you whole, and then many of them, he told them, go and sin no more. So he's telling us the same things as well. He wants to make us whole, but he needs our cooperation. And there's simple things to cooperate with, and he will give us the strength and power to do so. And so that's what I have to share with you right now, and I think we're going to transition into some Q&A time. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sandoval. Uh, Again, thank you, those of you who are watching. Um, I want to introduce our panelists tonight, my good friends. First of all, Pastor Adrian. He pastors two churches in the Chicagoland area, and uh, one is in Joliet, one is in Addison. So we want to welcome you, Adrian. And uh, Pastor John, he is the pastor in the Elmhurst uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, we are so glad that you join us, and especially for uh, for you, uh, Dr. Mark. Uh, John, I'm going to start with a question for you. Um, what do you think about my nose? <laughs> do you have any thoughts on my nose? I'm not going to comment publicly. Uh, are you gonna Are you gonna play in the uh, uh, Christmas? Uh... <laughs> Those of you who may be wondering, I had a wonderful day today. I went to play some soccer with my my son, my oldest son, and with other friends, and it was very sunny. So uh, when I when I came on, I was like, "Oh my, I look different." So I hope you can put up with me, uh, Doctor Sandoval. I have a book here. It's entitled "The Law of Life," and lo and behold, it seems that you are the one who wrote it. Uh, be great. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we can find in this book? Or can you give us any other resources that, you know, you gave us a wonderful presentation, very insightful, but only 30 minutes long. And I know that there is so much more that people need to know. So um, tell us about the book. Tell us about any other resources that you may have. Yeah, there. Um, the book, The Law of Life, is uh, is basically helping individuals to see how their thoughts and their attitudes play into their health status, and how, by the help of God, that can be reversed so that their diseases can be healed. And uh, everybody has bad habits for a reason, and many of us don't understand why we have the bad habits and what the reasons are, the thinking or the problems behind that. And that book kind of gets to the basis of that to help us to understand what are our motivations and to help us to have the correct motivations so that it becomes an easy thing rather than forcing ourselves to do the real, the good stuff. But there are some other resources that I think would be really helpful. One of them is a book called The Ministry of Healing. The Ministry of Healing. You look it up, the author is, the last name is White. You look up the Ministry of Healing and White, and, um, and it is, uh, it's a beautiful book that looks at all different aspects of one's life and the things that contribute to health and the things that contribute to disease and, and, and uh, ways that you can go about helping with them. Also, Yuchi Pines Institute. Yuchi is U-C-H-E-E. -E. That's kind of an odd spelling. It's named after Native Americans in the area. But we have a website, yuchipines.org, and we've got on there counseling sheets, over 500 counseling sheets with different conditions and what things you can do naturally for those. And then we also have a YouTube channel that has hundreds of videos on various different health conditions that can be beneficial as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to remind our viewers that we are glad to take your questions. Uh, we had a test earlier to make sure that you know how to use the chat, and we do want to acknowledge that there were some people watching, even from all the way from uh, New York State. Uh, we have Sauli from Flushing, New York. Thank you for watching. Hopefully, you can join us tomorrow night as well. We have uh, Jesse from Joliet. We also have Peter from... Uh, Carol stream and I'm sure there are others, but yeah, if you have comments or questions 
uh, please feel free to put them in your in your uh, comment box and uh, we'll do our best to address those here tonight. Um, Dr. Sandoval, I, uh, I have a question. You know, you presented some um, principles um, that we find right there at the beginning of the Bible um, that will help us uh, to prevent diseases. Um, would those also apply to um, infectious diseases? Like, you know, we just went through a pandemic. Um, will those principles apply to something that is transmissible? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, because uh, ones um, to develop an infection, it, it is not just dependent upon exposure. Now, exposure is one part of the issue, but susceptibility is the other part of the issue as well. So you know that there are some individuals, like with COVID, uh, where some individuals, of course, have died. Many individuals have died with COVID, and there are other individuals that that barely, barely knew that they had a runny nose um, when they had COVID. And so some individuals are quite susceptible and other ones are not. And there are these same factors that help with dealing with disease and preventing disease are the same things that help us to be less susceptible to um, anything that comes our way that we, that we are um, confronted with, including infectious agents. So yes, they are the same principles will help you uh, to, to do better and to prevent developing an infection when you are confronted with these things in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question uh, on the screen. Actually, there are popping up more questions, uh, but there is one that we have also here for our discussion, but also it is on the screen. I will go with the screen. Uh, it says, Dr. Sandola, Sandoval, what is your advice for someone diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer? All right. Well, stage 3 colon cancer, <clears throat> you still have um, things relatively contained in the area. And uh, with the stage 3 colon cancer, there are a number of things that, um, that I would recommend. We do have uh, plenty of evidence that shows that uh, individuals... With, as far as prevention is concerned, and we do have some evidence with treatment as well, that individuals that have a high consumption of fruits and vegetables in their diet do significantly better uh, with, uh, with cancer as well. Of the vegetables, the allium family, which is your garlic, uh, onions, leeks, and chives, that is apparently the best um, family as far as its anti-cancer potential is concerned. Another one that's very good is cruciferous vegetables. So that's your cabbage and kohlrabi and, and kale and, and uh, broccoli and cauliflower and those, uh, those forms. And so those tend to be actually quite beneficial for individuals. Uh, there's been a bit of research showing that it has uh, beneficial effects with cancer. Of course, you want to avoid processed meats. You want to avoid uh, dairy products, eggs, fried foods, sweeteners. All of those are things that tend to feed and contribute to the cancer. Um, you want to look out for other toxins uh, in the environment um, that you might be coming into contact with as well. Exercise. There's research that shows that individuals that have higher levels of exercise uh, survive their cancer better than those who don't. Um, vitamin D. We know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with increased rates of cancer and that individuals that have good vitamin D levels do much better uh, as far as cancer is concerned. And what levels do you want? Well, ideal is around 60 to 75. And the American population is averaging somewhere around 23. Normal begins at 30, but really you're aiming for around 60 to 75. And so uh, as our pastor Sammy has done, he's gotten some sunshine. That's a good thing. Uh, that's one of your best areas of uh, best ways of getting uh, vitamin D. But vitamin D supplementation with vitamin D3 is also something that can be helpful as well. Uh, you, of course, want to avoid tobacco. You want to avoid uh, alcohol, other toxins that promote cancer. And then there are certain uh, foods and herbs that are particularly beneficial. Uh, we know sweet wormwood, uh, sweet wormwood, it tastes horrible. I, I, I'll tell you right now, it just tastes horrible. Wormwood is horrible tasting, but uh, cancer doesn't like it either. 
Um, so maybe if you have it in a capsule form or other things of that nature. Turmeric, there's a lot of research showing turmeric is beneficial as well. Uh, red clover, black cumin seed, aloe, your, your plant, aloe plant, the gel from the inside of it, shiitake and maitake mushrooms. There's research that shows all of these. Now, one of the things Roger was talking about was, uh, Roger Swelt in the video at the beginning, was talking about contrast showers. And contrast showers can be beneficial, but one of the things that's actually quite beneficial is forcing yourself to have a fever. And the way that you can do that is in a bath, a hot bath. Now, you want to get checked out by a doctor beforehand. You don't want to do this if you have heart failure. And, and there's some conditions where it would be dangerous, especially if you have heart rhythm problems and so on. But uh, if you don't have any of those and you're relatively healthy other than the cancer, then getting in a hot bath and getting your oral temperature up to at least 102, between 102 to 104 degrees and maintaining it there for about 20 to 30 minutes. Keep your head nice and cool. Uh, drink water in the meantime. Have somebody with you so that you're not alone and so on. Uh, and then uh, having a cold shower briefly afterwards and then get in bed and you know, kind of sweat it out for a little bit. Doing that three to five times a week, about three weeks out of every month for about six months or so, uh, has shown to be actually quite helpful. And then, of course, working on those thoughts and attitudes, having a positive uh, outlook on life and being, uh, you know, involved in service projects to others. All of that are those are beneficial. Uh, but you do want to get it checked out. Work with your doctor and. Um, and then work with a healthcare professional who knows how to, uh, you know, help walk you through all of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandoval. And Nagita, uh, I don't know if you are asking about yourself or a friend, a family member, but I want to assure you that we will pray for you because I believe, we believe that God heals. God is the ultimate healer. He has given us principles and we are to follow them, but the, the healing, we believe, comes from God. Um, so Dr. Sandoval, you just mentioned now that, you know, work with your doctor. So this person or any other person goes to the doctor and the doctor hears what this, you know, we learn here tonight. And they say, what are you talking about? You know, this is, you know, like foolishness. So what can we, what can people do? How can we, in a way, help educate our doctors into some of these things? Or what would, what would be a good approach to create this partnership with a healthcare provider? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, and, uh, and the answer is how you approach the issue with the doctor. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I'm a doctor, and so, um, and I've worked in, ER, I've worked in ICU, I've worked in hospital, I've worked in um, urgent care uh, in a number of situations. And I can tell you that when I came out of medical school and in the early part of my practice, I was very much a proud doctor because I was taught by proud doctors and proud doctors make proud doctors. And so if you contradict your doctor, the doctor might just rise up in pride and not be happy at you and, and uh, so on and so forth. And doctors have been known to fire their patients and, and other things like that. So you've got, to, you've got to approach the doctor with a little bit of humility and from the standpoint of the learner, right? And so if you ask the doctor questions as if you want to know, right? You want to know, you want to see what their thoughts are on a particular issue rather than telling them, well, I'm not going to do what you are telling me to do. I've got this other regimen and whatever. They don't take that very well. Right, so you come with a with the idea of a learner uh, as one that's humble and say, okay, well, uh, you know, what about this? I've heard that this has science behind it and that can be beneficial. Um, and um, and uh, you know, it, are there any contradictions, contraindications to taking this with any of the things that I'm on or that you're recommending for me? And and um, do you know of any other practitioners that you're working with that are uh, also well-versed in uh, alternative or complementary therapies, you know, and sometimes you have to just shop around and you've got to find a physician that's willing to work with you and the things that you're convicted on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandoval. Um, mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, you know, some some of us may, uh, may deal with uh, being uh, um, 
you know, tired all the time. But there are people, and we have uh, actually two questions uh, that were sent in asking about insomnia. Uh, what is the best way to deal with this? Yeah, well, insomnia, <clears throat> there are several reasons why an individual might have insomnia. Um, one of the reasons is they might have sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a situation where, where I should say that an individual has poor sleep patterns and is tired throughout the day, uh, even though they do get to sleep. Uh, and that's where they, where they stop breathing at nighttime uh, while they're sleeping. And if that's the case, usually associated with obesity, there's several things that can help. Weight loss is a big one, um, but there can be a CPAP machine uh, that can help with pushing air in. There can be a, a dental implant device, not an implant, but a device that you put in that kind of for forces the lower jaw forward so that the tongue doesn't fall back as far. Um, but most individuals that deal with insomnia have trouble getting to sleep. And when that's the case, I've found that most of the time it's because we can't shut those thoughts down, right? So we're trying to get to sleep, but we've got our thoughts running a million miles a minute. We can't get them shut down. We're trying to figure out how to get this taken care of. How are we going to fix this thing? A lot of times it's associated with worry. And when that is the case of an individual, then my suggestion is become a prayer warrior at nighttime. And so when you lay down, that's your intercessory prayer time. During the daytime, you pray for yourself. At nighttime, you pray for others. And so you get your prayer list. And when you lay down, you start praying and you pray for this person and that person and that person and that thing and that thing and the other thing and so on. And if your mind starts wandering, pull it back and keep your prayer list where you're at and, uh, and keep going through it. And if you fall asleep while you're praying, okay. If you stay up longer, okay. I'll tell you this. Jesus frequently spent the entire night in prayer and he, and, and, and he never broke the health laws, right? So... Connecting with the Father is just like getting sleep. It's refreshing as well. So if you can't sleep, connect with the Father. But I don't mean staying up having the lights on. What you should do is have a regular routine, um, have a regular bedtime, and it should be relatively early, not later than 10 o'clock at night. You want to get those before midnight hours. And that routine should be calming. It shouldn't include a lot of exciting stuff. So don't watch the latest, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger shoot em up movie. And, uh, you know, probably not the latest news either. Um, you know, have something that's, that's uh, calming, reading a book, having devotions, other things of that nature, take a warm bath. And, and then get into bed, have a cool room, turn it dark, set your alarm for, for when you need to wake up in the morning, and then turn the alarm around so that you can't look at it. Don't look at any clocks at night. It doesn't matter how many hours of sleep you get at night. It only matters how rested you are the next day. And people get really anxious because they get focused on the hours. They get focused on the time. Turn that thing around. Don't look at it. Dark environment, but a clear pathway if you need to get up to the bathroom. And otherwise, avoid getting up. Spend that as prayer time. And there are some herbs that can help, like um, like uh, catnip and um, hops. Although watch out for hops because it can increase breast cancer. Um, <laughs> and uh, valerian and passion flower and um, chamomile and lavender. All of those can uh, help individuals be a little bit more sleepy and have more effective sleep. Thank you. So that uh, that will be better than even counting sheep, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Praying for others. Yes. Thank you. Sounds yeah. good. I, I do want to piggyback on this because uh, recently I watched a TED talk on sleep. I don't remember the name of the researcher, but um, he mentioned no caffeine before bed or at all and no alcohol. Sometimes we... Mm -hmm fool ourselves thinking that, you know, I can, I need to calm down or I need to, but he, and he gives the reasons why, because that is not sleep. Even if we are, you know, dozing off that our brain is not resting. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And the more alcohol somebody uses over time, insomnia gets worse. So it worsens the cycle and caffeine doesn't help at all. Uh, I have a question regarding, I'm concerned about even you, Dr. Sandoval, you said that the sun is good for vitamin D, but the red sun and like Sammy's nose, I'm concerned about him. Uh, uh, Thank what, you, John. 
he, is he in a danger of getting cancer or something like that? Yeah. Uh, exposure to sun, how do we cover ourselves? Uh, because we know that UV rays are very strong and high actually, and how do we deal with this? Yes, well, sun exposure needs to be, um, uh, what should I say, measured out a bit. You have to take into consideration what latitude you are on the planet, uh, what your skin color is, and so on. And what you want to do is you want to avoid burning. That's really the biggest thing that you want to avoid is burning. Um, so uh, you want to get the sun exposure for, for, um, for vitamin D production, the best vitamin D production that you're going to have is going to be midday, right? But that's the time when you have the greatest burning capacity is midday. Um, and there is concern for the development of skin cancer, but there is a, there's some research that shows that if everybody would get the sun exposure that they need to, then for every one person that died from skin cancer because of the additional sun exposure, a hundred people would not die from cancer, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and a whole host of other conditions because they have normal vitamin D levels. So yes, sun exposure can increase the risk of cancer, um, but that's mostly when an individual burns. And so you want to get regular sun exposure, smaller amounts, make sure that you keep under the burning limit, um, but do so on a regular basis. And you want to get a fairly large area of the body. So, you know, I mean, if you go out there and you stick your pinky out in the sunshine, uh, you're not going to get much vitamin D. You got to get sufficient exposure. And even if you're dressed like I am right now in long sleeves and, you know, head and whatever, I'm still not going to get enough vitamin D with that. If you're going to get vitamin D, You've got a you've got a sunbathe, right? So sitting down in the sun, laying down in the sun, and purposefully do so, uh, and uh, that's about the only way that you're going to get vitamin D levels in a normal range with uh, with sun exposure, and that's really what you're aiming for because there's your major health benefit. I have just one question regarding because previously you mentioned that we should take uh, uh, supplements, vitamin D three. Uh, so what are we taking? Uh, 1,000 IU, 2,000, 3, 5,000. What would be something that is recommended? Right. It depends on what said, 8,000. Okay. <laughs> right. That's what I heard. Um, yeah. It depends on the individual and their size because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So, uh, the individuals that I have seen that have been vitamin D, uh, toxic. So they've begun, begun, they've gotten toxic on vitamin D exposure, uh, are typically small individuals that have very little fat. And so it's typically been small women that have had a lot of body fat. And, uh, so they've been taking vitamin D. It accumulates very quickly and then the blood levels start increasing. Now, if you have an, an, an individual that is, uh, you know, six foot five and they're 400 pounds, and they've got quite a bit of um, you know, fat that's hanging around, well, they can take a ton of vitamin D and it doesn't seem like their blood levels are going up very much. It's because that vitamin D is getting shuttled to the fat tissue, it's getting stored there and you don't see much of it in the bloodstream. Uh, so it really be depends on the pe person's body habitus is how much that they need. Um, most individuals will do well with around 5,000 to you know, 8,000 or so international units on a daily basis. But if you have some smaller uh, individuals, you gotta watch that. Uh, and larger individuals, they're gonna need, need more. And if, you're already, and if you haven't been supplementing, you're probably gonna have to double or triple that for probably a month in order to get your blood levels into a good range before you then cut down to the 5,000 or so international units on a daily basis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandoval. Uh, um, we have one more question, and uh, I think the time is kind of uh, uh, an issue here. Uh, what is the reason for feeling bloated, tried, um, tired, probably, and sluggish? Uh, well, there can be a number of reasons for that. Part of the reason might be that uh, an individual is eating too much, right? 
so if you overeat, then you burden the digestive tract. It takes a long time for the stomach to empty. Uh, it has to work for a long period of time, and then you can have bloating associated with it. Bloating can also be associated with having too great of a variety of food at any given time. Uh, so you might want to look at cutting down on the variety, maybe only having three or four um, you know, different uh, types of items at the meal. Uh, you want to make sure that you eat slowly, that you chew thoroughly. Uh, if you're eating quickly, you're going to be swallowing a lot more air along with it. And so that can kind of contribute to the bloating as well. Bloating can be associated with uh, the consumption of too much beans, or if the beans have been uh, not processed very well, uh, then you can have excess bloating with that. Um, or you can have a problem with your, uh, the type of bacteria in your digestive tract. And so it might be beneficial taking some digestive enzymes and uh, probiotics for a while and see if that helps out. Fasting for a few days actually might help out, but not if you're on Medicaid, not on diabetes medication or steroids. If you're on diabetes medications or steroids, don't fast. Um, most of your other medications you can do okay with. Um, but fasting might help that for a few days and, uh, and uh, you know help you out there okay one uh, one last question and uh, then we are going to give you dr sandoval the last word uh thank you again to all of you for for uh, joining us again remember tomorrow night at 7 30 central time we continue with our third presentation in this series fearful or fearless navigating life's crisis so please join us, please invite your friends and share these messages with those that you think may uh, benefit uh, from it. So Dr. Sandoval, the last question, as I said, and you can go on to your, to your conclusion. Uh, what would you say to someone who is perhaps a little bit skeptical about the claims that you're making? Perhaps, you know, they think, oh, it's maybe too good to be true. You know, like, what do you mean eating vegetables can help me live a better life? Is it that simple or exercising or going out in the sun? What would you say to somebody uh, like that? Well, I would say that no single thing is a magic bullet, right? It's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a single issue. So, you know, if you eat garlic, garlic isn't going to save you from everything. And if you eat this, it's not going to save you from everything. There is, uh, it's a pattern. It's a lifestyle. It's everything pulled together. You see, God loves you. He loves you so much. And he is such a wonderful God. And he has put a plan together. And he has put a way for you to have health and healing and happiness. And it involves all sorts of things. It involves what you think about. It involves what you eat. It involves the things you enjoy. It involves the activities that you're involved in and all of these different things. And he wants you to have that health. He wants you to have that, that, uh, that blessing. He wants you to have the the happiness and the strength and everything that goes along with it and it's a plan it's a plan that involves all sorts of different things and the more you incorporate those things the more benefits that you'll see the more consistent you are at uh, at applying those things the more benefits that you will see associated with it and for individuals that come to our lifestyle center and their lives change around and and they begin to apply things in ways that they had they had not seen and understood before yeah we see some tremendous things that happen is it everybody no it does do some people come and they get worse well yeah because they come very late in their disease process so it's always better to, to start earlier but it's never too late to start and I would say, trust the Lord, cooperate with him, learn the principles that he has for you, study, find resources that will help you in that process, and everything you learn, begin to apply, and apply it little by little, or a lot at once, and be, be consistent. The ones that are consistent the best are the ones that uh, is, th those are the ones that are gonna do the best in the long run. Of those that I have run into that have health years later when they were supposed to die, those are the ones that are consistent. And consistency is key. And it's also a fruit of the spirit. And so you need the Holy Spirit in your life that gives you the fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control, which leads you to consistency. And so I call you back to God and back to a lifestyle that he created us for at the beginning. And, uh, and that is my, my desire for you. 
And may you be blessed as you apply these things in your life. to fear when times of trouble come oppression storm beats at your door no need to fear no need to fear Though evil seems so strong, their pride and power is not for long. Be still, my soul, and trust in God, and place your life into his hands for he will never never fail you and in the morning you see his face no need to fear don't fear. No need to fear the envy and the scorn of those who boast in what they own no need to fear for what remains when life's brief day is done their glories are a setting sun but as for me, of this I'm sure, God will redeem my soul from death, and he will never, never fail me. And in the morning, I'll see his can tear you from his love, and he will never forsake you, and in the morning you see his face. No need to fear. Don't